everyone. Um, thank you for coming. It's uh, really humbling to be here. And thank you, Addie, for inviting me. Um, so hi, my name is Ingrid. Uh, I've been using a lot of times as my one-liner artist statement that I make maps and tell jokes, uh, which is to say I think a lot about power, um, given that maps and jokes are tremendous instruments for exercising, uh, explaining, and challenging power. And I'm going to just be talking about some work that I guess I've been doing, I guess, for the last 18 months that started with what I think of as an image problem. So when stories about online and phone-based mass surveillance started rolling out, the stock photography was really weak. And the images all seemed to not really capture, to me, um, what we were actually seeing happen. There were a lot of, like, white dudes looking at screens and a lot of, like, blue filter, like, I don't, I don't know what's good. Like, I have Sauron shit. And, and part of this problem is that it's an abstract thing, right? But the other part is that, that the, the parts that aren't abstract, like the actual places where surveillance takes place, the kinds of images that you can even get are sort of limited, right? Um, this is probably one of my favorite photos I've ever taken. It's at a, a park next to the NSA. It's like for famous fallen spy planes. And not only does it have a, a list of things you shouldn't take a picture of, it has a picture of the kind of picture you can't have. So not only does the NSA uh, have really strict rules about what kinds of images can be put out about it. There's like that one famous stock photo and then Peglin made another one. They also have control over like an image that is like impossible to create. Um, and then one of the other things like that I have Sauron clip art thing I think does is it, it amps up the mystique factor and I think kind of adds to this idea that like these institutions are like you know, unimpenetrable. Um, this is a mouse pad that I bought at the uh, Cryptology Museum next door to the NSA. Um, and, you know, they, they can't summon lightning. I, like, this, this stuff, I think it kind of feeds into a culture of fear around this stuff. And I, I'm really into uh, exposing sort of the banality of power, the way in which a lot of these things that are kind of sensationalized or terrifying are really just you know, white dudes in suburban office parks. And I, I started with looking a lot at one particular office park. Um, so this map, um, down at the bottom, that's the NSA. And then a little further to the top and to the left, that is an office park um, that I first started noticing. I went down to Fort Meade for uh, Chelsea Manning's trial and was just looking around at things that were in the area and saw all these defense contractors in this office park. And I was like, that's inevitable. Um, it turns out this property, which is called the National Business Park, is owned by a real estate investment trust called um, Corporate Office Properties Trust. And their entire like business strategy appears to be buy land next to major defense outposts and build offices for defense contractors and the government, um, which is actually like a pretty smart business strategy if like you're a real estate company. <laughs> um, so this to me, like, this is where surveillance, like, actually happens, right? So much of the work that is being done by the government is actually being done by third parties. And it's a very lucrative business. And so I, I went um, to this office park and kind of just walked around it. And it's boring. It's really kind of weird and boring. And it's weird to think about the fact that these companies that are enormous and involved in pretty unseemly shit appear like this, like, like this kind of crappy building with this kind of crappy public art. Um, and at the same time, there's all these sort of like little hints to what is actually there. Like there are certain roads that you can't really go much further past on without needing to show like specific kinds of ID. Um, I was interested in trying to use like that specific like landscape and a maps of it as a way to see how the military industrial complex has become increasingly privatized. So I started looking at uh, Landsat <laughs> satellite imagery. So this is an image of that office park in um, 2002. That was the oldest one that I could find. It's kind of tiled together from a couple. So there's a you know, couple buildings there, you know, they apparently are doing okay. Um, this is 2006. Uh, it's not a perfect transition, but you can see there are at least a few more buildings. But then there's about eight new buildings that have been added to this. What happened between 2002 and 2006? Well, 
I mean, the obvious one is that we invaded Iraq, but the other one in 2002 was um, Project Trailblazer was uh, started. I don't know how many people here are familiar with Project Trailblazer. It was a giant uh, information surveillance program that was contracted out to, I have to always write this down, um, SAIC, Boeing, CSC, and Booz Allen Hamilton. It was a complete boondoggle. Um, and this was the project that a number of whistleblowers inside the Department of Defense brought to the Inspector General um, because the NSA could have built it themselves for a lot less money. <laughs> um, and this is why Thomas Drake was indicted for the Espionage Act. This is the, the property in 2012. There's another million square feet that's been added since 2006. There's nine more buildings. So this is a very small but very interesting illustration to me of the fact that um, the military industrial complex isn't just weapons or malware, it's real estate, it's property, it's, it's bodies, it's humans, right? One of the things that I thought was super interesting as I started looking into this particular real estate company was that they had started this business pivot to running data centers, which of course is, you know, extremely smart. Um, <laughs> But it, it led me, and trying to go see their data centers and other data centers, led me into this kind of misleadingly banal question, which is, um, how do you see the internet? And I guess this is how most of us like see the internet, like we're you know interfacing with it. But when you try to actually explain to someone like what the internet is or how to like comprehend it, you get a lot of really abstract network diagrams and really misleading metaphors and clip art. Don't get me started on the cloud, because like this is the cloud. Right? This is an Amazon data center in Northern Virginia, and um, it's not calling attention to itself. It's kind of a crucial piece of infrastructure, and it's something that you would never really even notice. So th at this point in the year, I started to get really obsessed with network infrastructure. Um, this is what happens when you start talking to people about infrastructure, I have learned, um, and I completely understand why, um, because it's something that was sort of designed to be ignored. Right? Like, you really only notice infrastructure when it stops working. Um, we can get into whether there is something about the internet that is no longer working, perhaps later. Uh, I should probably just move on to a little more of methods. So, I had, it turns out if, if you want uh, maps of like where fiber lines are and want to get a better sense of like data center geography, people won't just tell you. Um, so, I kind of had to figure it out myself. And I started out kind of really small. Like, I just wanted to figure out, like, how can I see the internet within, like, one city block around me, like, walking down the street in Manhattan? Turns out a really good way to do that is to look down. Um, I imagine you've seen things like this before, walking down the street, like, spray paint on, like, intersections and streets. This is stuff that's put down on the street prior to street excavation work. And it's basically a way for people doing that work to know what's around them so that if they're going to, like, be doing work on a gas line, they don't accidentally cut the power to an entire neighborhood. Uh, they're all color-coded. There's, like, an international standard for this. And all the orange ones are telecommunications. That includes uh, telephone and TV as well as, as internet. Um, but once you start looking for these, you really can't not see them. It's kind of, I kind of started to think of them kind of like a, the crying of Lot 49. Like you could just find the postal horn everywhere. And there's like some fun things you can do with this. So like this is a little, like it's a weird way to kind of reverse engineer where certain fiber lines are. These are um, two lines that are running out of 111 8th Avenue, which is a major carrier hotel into 85 10th Avenue, which has a level three co-location center. Um, fun fact, also home to the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force offices, IDK. But that's a very like tedious way to work through that problem, right? To try and like walk through the entire city following orange lines. And eventually like I'm gonna get hit by a bus. So the other way that I've been approaching this problem is by working on a field guide so that anyone can figure out what these things are and what they're looking at and see the internet on the street. Um, and this is going to be printed in January. It's also a weird way to get in a lot of sideways information about the politics of network infrastructure. Like in this slide, there's a, a side about like dark fiber. What is it? Why do all these ISPs have it? Why do they sell it for so much money to banks? Um, 
a version of this also exists online. So I'm a little more into the idea of like a handheld experience with it. But if you're interested, it's out there. One of the things that a lot of this work has made me think a lot about is um, scale. Um, so there was a time when computers used to be the size of an entire room to function. And while we've been able to make hardware that is smaller, I believe that the room has simply gotten bigger to about the size of the planet. Um, we are surrounded by sensors everywhere. And a lot of them are fairly mundane. Um, and a lot of them are we can kind of easily forget about and have been there for a long time. I think sometimes I get a little side eye at, at the hype over the internet of things because we've had this shit around for a while. Um, and then there's elements of it that's kind of insidious and is kind of working as private networks that we can't really understand and that are increasingly actually on human bodies. Okay, this next slide is going to seem like a detour, but it's actually just taking the scenic route to a related point. So bear with me. Um, this is a small project that I finished very recently and is kind of related to what I'm trying to work on next while I'm here this week. So a couple of weeks ago, a German newspaper released a story about GCHQ's uh, capping, tapping of some uh, submarine cables, the cables that ex like connect ocean internets to each other. Um, and this wasn't new, like people had known that they were doing it, but this was the first article that released a document that had a list of exactly which cables, which happens to be pretty easy to find public information, like just the existence of like where cables are. Um, telegeography maintains a really nice data set about them. So I just kind of mashed those together <laughs> and made a map of which cables are being tapped and which ones aren't and which programs they're associated with and which companies own those cables because that can also give you a sense of what these codename programs, who the partner organizations affiliated with them are. This was a quote from a Department of Defense document uh, that was essentially basically making the argument that communication networks are weapon systems. Like not the, literally, like not like they're a means to it and they like they were basically like communication systems are weapons. <laughs> And to me, this, this kind of illustrates a certain urgency for why you might want to care about infrastructure and might want to know about fiber lines beneath your feet um, because they have been weaponized, they've been militarized. And it would be cool if we could make them less that. And what I'm interested in or been thinking a lot about this week is how to follow a thread that connects you from the massive military industrial networks um, that are capturing information and storing and, you know, separating networks the, all the time. This is um, a 2004 map of the CIPRNET, which is um, the secure, Internet, secure Information Protocol Routing Network. It's the Department of Defense's private classified network that spans a huge amount of the world. Connecting this to police departments that now are able to collect cell phone data of protesters. There is, there is a link that is bringing things from this really high level from submarine cables down to the street, back to that intersection where you're just trying to find the internet. Um, and I don't totally know what that looks like. And I'm, I'm hoping to figure it out. And I, I don't want to think of it as a demoralizing point. Um, I think it's a challenge that kind of has to be taken on and is worth taking on. Um, but, uh, wait, have I only been talking for six minutes? No, no, this is wrong. All right. Uh, thank you very much.